Hello, everybody. Good evening. It's fantastic to see a good, large, friendly crowd here tonight. This is the first time I've um, gone to one of the professorial lecture event pages and seen the blissful words, this event is sold out. You must have registered for it. So bravo. Uh, thanks for joining us this evening for the first of the professorial lectures in the College of Asia and the Pacific series for 2024. This uh, lecture series began last year as a way to honor those who have been promoted to full professor the year before. And we take this opportunity to celebrate the outstanding achievements of our colleagues and to welcome you as a community and see what people, are, see what people have been doing to get them to this point. I'm Matt Tomlinson. I'm the director of the School of Culture, History, and Language. So I am obviously representing CHL. But I'm also uh, here on behalf of the College of Asia and the Pacific um, in place of our dean, Professor Helen Sullivan, who unfortunately had to be overseas. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting here on the lands of the Ngunnawal and Nambri peoples. And we do pay our respects to these traditional elders of the Canberra region. We pay our respects to elders past, present, and emerging, and extend our respects to all First Nations members of our audience this evening. So tonight, we're here to celebrate and recognize Professor McComas Taylor's contributions to teaching and research in CHL and the College of Asia and the Pacific. It's, he's hard to introduce because many of you must know him already because he is an amazing scholar, a very inspiring teacher, and a deeply valued colleague. He is a legend. So this is an honor to be able to introduce him here for the professorial lecture. For those of you who aren't as familiar with his work, he specializes in the teaching and learning of Sanskrit. His research lies at this intersection of the classic Sanskrit narrative literature and modern contemporary critical theory. His research interests include ideas of social division in Sanskrit narrative literature and the role of Sanskrit texts in contemporary Hindu practice. That's on his CV. The, the, the extra, the, the oomph that makes it really exciting is that he is an absolute champion of open access publishing. Those of you who know ANU Press and its role in leading open access publishing globally for academics, here is one of the star authors. With ANU Press published open access, freely available to anyone in the world. McComas has produced the first year textbook, The Joy of Sanskrit, a new translation of the, of the Vishnu Purana, which is also available as a free audiobook. You can just listen to it for free, the first audiobook ever published by ANU Press. As well as if this weren't enough, a recent edited volume with Raj Balkaran titled Visions and Revisions in Sanskrit Narrative. He's an exemplary academic citizen. McComas has led the South Asia program in the College of Asia and the Pacific. Beginning in 2025, he will be our deputy director of languages in the School of Culture, History, and Language. Now, I've noticed from the past lectures that this is the point where I'm supposed to say something embarrassing about him. Just do that little cut just before you take the stage. No, well, the, the, the sad news for the audience is I couldn't find anything embarrassing about you, um, but uh, I will give one more detail that I find very compelling, um, which is not on your academic CV, which is that McComas is the expert on regional bird life, especially. So there is a standard guide. If you're interested in birds, there is the standard guide, Birds of the Australian Capital Territory and Atlas. Guess who the lead author is? <laughs> And I can tell you, he, he is not a scholar on a pedestal. I have approached him sometimes in great eagerness and once in panic, asking him about the sounds I was hearing from trees on hikes and in my backyard. And I can say that McComas always responded extremely helpfully with identifying what these things were that were flying around. So for his amazing accomplishments as a teacher, as a scholar, a translator, a published, uh, um, and a published author, it's my great pleasure to welcome to the lectern tonight, Professor McComas Taylor. Thanks very much. That was very kind. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> Thanks very much, Matt. I slept so badly last night. I had three very discomforting dreams. The first one was the old classic where, you know, you come to give your lecture and you haven't got your lecture notes. That's a classic. Everyone knows that one. The second dream, I was coming to give this lecture on a ferry, but the ferry stopped before the land and I had to swim the last 10 metres and I arrived dripping wet. 
The third dream, I can't believe I did this. The third dream, I arrived to give the lecture and the entire audience were Maori and didn't speak English. <laughs> so I have my lecture notes. Uh, I'm dry as a bone and you folk understand English. So I think we are set to begin. So thank you very much for joining us tonight. Uh, I'm going to begin by a, a, a traditional invocation to Ganesha, the elephant headed deity who is nourished by the essence of the fruit of kapita and jambu trees, who is the son of Sutta, who is the remover of obstacles and the cause of happiness. So this is a traditional invita invocation of Lord Ganesha. If you know this, please, you can join me. Gajana nam puta ganadi sevitam Kapita jambu palasara bhakshitam Umasutam shoka vinasha karanam Namami vigneshvara pada pankajam so we are now guaranteed that everything will run smoothly. Friends, thank you very much for joining us tonight. I was never going to be a Sanskritist. I would never intended to become a Sanskritist. In the early 1990s, my life was running very smoothly. I'd had a happy and successful career in Chinese studies. I was happily teaching Tibetan in the community here in Canberra. I was the ever helpful gopher at an organisation called the Centre of Resource and Environmental Studies, which was the forerunner of the Fenner School. Uh, we were publishing lovely posters that showed the phase of the moon for every day of the year. And I was writing books about uh, birds, you remind me, <laughs> Matt. Never had I thought I would become a Sanskritist until 1995. It was September. It was, in fact, the 8th of September, a Saturday night, when people hit momentous events in, the, in their life. They very often remember small, seemingly irrelevant details. I remember that night was a full moon night. The full moon night of the 8th of September, Saturday night, 1995. It was that night that SBS showed the film of Peter Brook's Mahabharata. Who is Peter Brook? Peter Brook is a very well-known British uh, theatre director. He was actually the director of the Royal Shakespeare Company. Peter Brook, 10 years earlier, in the mid-80s, in collaboration with Jean-Claude Carrière, the French uh, playwright, Brook had reduced the Mahabharata, the great Indian epic, to a 12-hour long dramatic performance that was performed by an international cast. It had cast members from Africa, cast members from Asia, cast members from Europe in a wonderful, wonderful production with very simple monochrome uh, costumes in a very simple, uh, very simple stage setting. This production of Mahabharatam toured the world for four years in the mid-1980s. The setting that was chosen was usually, every city he went to, the setting that was chosen was a quarry. And this play began as the sun set and it finished 12 hours later as the sun rose. And people who saw this production now, 40 years ago, still talk about it as a life changing event, as you can imagine. And this all night dramatic performance is very much a traditional Indian, uh, an Indian practice. Now, that 12 hour dramatic performance was reduced to a six hour video. And that's what, that's what I saw on SBS that night, the 12 hour, the six hour video of the 12 hour dramatic performance. So it's basically a film of a play. Now, um, that for me was 12 hours, of, uh, that was six hours of extraordinarily intense engagement. I was absolutely hooked on this. It's highly stylized, very simple sets. Uh, the story is, a, is of a cataclysmic civil war between 
two groups of cousins. And I'll talk about this a little bit later. I'll give you a summary of the plot a little bit further this evening. But very prophetically, at the beginning of the six-hour video, the narrator says, if you listen carefully to this story, by the end, you'll be someone else. If you listen carefully to this story, by the end, you will be someone else. Little did I realise how much truth there was in that. So the story, the six hour video, uh, <clears throat> it has humans responding to impossible decisions, impossible conflicts between individual volition and social expectation, insuperable moral dilemmas, great spiritual revelation, betrayal and loyalty, enormous psychological depth. They say no good man is entirely good. No bad man is entirely bad. But there is always the possibility of redemption. The six hour video is filled with gods and demons, heroes and villains, love and laughter, blood curdling curses, generous boons, vows, and frankly, it shook me to the core. Six hours later, uh, it's, now, it's now half past one in the morning, mind you. At half past one in the morning, I stood on my back step overlooking the clothes line and the, ve and the uh, vegetable garden, and I took a vow that I would spend the next 10 years studying Sanskrit so that I might read the Mahabharata in the original. I went out and bought a book. Now, I normally say it was the next day, but the next day was a Sunday, so it probably wasn't. It was probably the Monday. I went out and bought myself a book called Teach Yourself Sanskrit, which is arguably the worst possible thing I could have done. You cannot teach yourself Sanskrit. Now, <clears throat> I'm, going to, I'm going to leave me there. Let's leave me on the back step under that full moon, having taken my vow. What is Sanskrit? What is this language? Let me, let me tell you two truths. Here are two truths. One is a traditional truth. This, is, this would be the truth held by traditional Indian scholars, and that is Sanskrit pre-exists the universe. Sanskrit is called apurusheya. It is not the product of humans. Sanskrit exists there out in the universe, and you know that the universe is created and destroyed and created and destroyed over and over again. And the only thing that survives when the universe is destroyed each time is Sanskrit. Sanskrit continues to exist after the universe has been destroyed. And every new universe, Sanskrit is out there, but you need seven sages to hear it. So the seven sages are created very early on in this new universe, and it is their job to hear this Sanskrit out of the universe and then to promulgate it among the rest of humankind. Because uh, Sanskrit pre-exists the universe, oh, I should tell you, uh, three syllables, burbuva svaha. So Sanskrit creates the universe, but burbuva svaha creates the earth, the intermediate region, and the, uh, the heavens. And I once said to our, uh, our previous vice chancellor, who of course is a cosmologist, very interested in how the universe was created, I said, uh, there you go, Brian, that's the answer there. That's how the universe was created, problem solved. And he said, oh, thanks, McComas, I'll file that away. I'm not sure I convinced him. Anyway, so this is the, this is the traditional view of Sanskrit. Sanskrit has always existed. Sanskrit is apurusha. It's not, not created by humans. Now, there are a couple of corollaries uh, to that. And one, one I particularly like is that uh, in English, we call a tree a tree. In German, it's der Baum. In French, it's l'arbre. In, uh, in Greek, it's dendron. But as Sanskrit created the world, what it really is, what it really is, not just its name, but its actual essence is virksha. It's what it is called in Sanskrit. That's what things really are. The rest of these things, they're just words. They're just names. There's another thing that, that, that often pops up. Because Sanskrit pre-existed the world, it created everything, all languages descend from Sanskrit. Sanskrit is the mother. This is the traditional view. Sanskrit is the mother of all languages. And this caused quite a lot of 
trouble in the Indian census when they're collecting language data and they say, what is your mother language? So many people answer, oh, Sanskrit is my mother language because it's the mother of all languages. And it skews the census state very heavily in the direction of Sanskrit and causes great trouble for demographers. Okay, didn't I say there were two truths? That's one truth. That's very much the traditional view. It's still widely held uh, in, in, among uh, Indian, traditional Indian scholars and indeed among the Indian public in general. That's one truth. Now here's another truth. This is the truth that would be favoured by 99.9% .9 of international scholars. On the Eurasian steppe, somewhere between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, round about 5,000 before the current e era, there lived a people who spoke a language that historical linguistics, linguists call Proto-Indo-European. So Proto, they say Proto-Indo-European was, was uh, spoken by a group of people somewhere on the Eurasian steppe 7,000 years before the present. These people had uh, domesticated horses, they fought with chariots, and sometime after that, these, these people or the language they spoke were, were carried in different directions. Now, some of these people uh, migrated south and west into Anatolia, which is modern Turkey, and became the Hittites. The Hittites speak an Indo-European language. Others of them migrated west into Europe. And these became the ancestors of the Italic language family, the Germanic, which is of course where we fit in, that's where English comes from, the Slavic families, the Celtic families, the Hellenic and the Baltic families. All of these language families had either, either migrated into Western Europe or evolved in Western Europe. And they pushed all of those other languages out of Europe except one, which was squashed right up into the top northwest corner of Spain, which is the Basque language, exactly right. So this is the only non-Indo-European language on mainland continental Europe. Now, so we've got some people moving into Anatolia, we've got other people moving into uh, Europe. At the same time, some people moved south into what is now Iran, so Persia and they moved further south again into northern India. Now, these people, these people who moved into India probably 2000 before the current era brought with them an extraordinary treasure. And that treasure was a collection of oral verses known as the Veda, V-E-D-A. Now, Veda actually means wisdom. It's a cognate of the word uh, wit, or wisdom or wissen of Deutsch. So the Vedas are a set of knowledge. What does this knowledge consist of? This knowledge consists of a thousand hymns to the deities, a thousand songs of praise, a thousand prayers. Now these Vedic people were herding people, they're cattle herding people. And it always strikes me when we read these, these songs of praise that what these Vedic cattle herders needed are exactly the same sorts of things that our neighbours up at Crookwell need, cattle herding people need today. So they need sunshine, so prayers to the sun deity. They need rain, so the grass will grow, prayers to the rain deity. They need uh, prayers to the dawn to make sure the sun will rise and prayers for great big strong suns to run the family farm. So these are very much the concerns of the Vedas, these, these uh, transactional prayers to the deity to ensure the proper running of this, uh, this uh, herding society. Now, I'm going to jump forward from Vedic times, let's say 2000 to 1500 BCE. Let's wind the clock forward to about 500 before the current era. Now, the Vedic language is very, very complicated. Now, you know Sanskrit is complicated, right? Vedic is, is a whole different ball game. So Vedic has many, many alternative forms. It has many, many irregularities. Round about 500 before the current era, a scholar by the name of Parnini 
took all of the pre-existing knowledge about language, about the Vedic language, and he distilled it into short, easy to remember sutras, very short little formula, a little bit like, um, uh, a little bit like uh, I before E except after C. So easy ways to remember basic language rules. So Panini uh, collected all of the language rules that defined the language that he and his colleagues spoke at that time. Very easy to remember. But there was a downside. There are 4,000 of them. So the whole of Sanskrit language is, is defined by 4,000 rules. And from that time on, all of Sanskrit, this is now classical Sanskrit, as distinct from the old Vedic dialect, is defined by those 4,000 rules. Now, <clears throat> Sanskrita is Sanskrit for Sanskrit. Can I hear that, please? Samskrita. Everyone, please. Samskrita. The sum at the beginning is the same as the con in all of those uh, words we get from Latin. So connect, collect, communicate, all of those com words are the same as the sum from the same Indo-European root. The samskrita, the krita is the same as uh, uh, crete, as in concrete. So Sanskrit is Sanskrit for Sanskrit, and it actually is the same word as concrete. It's made firm. So Panini took the old, very complicated, very messy Vedic language, and he made it firm. He made it samskrita. He tidied it up. And interestingly enough, you know the word syncretic. Syncretic is the Greek equivalent. The syn also means together, and the kretic is also the made. So syncretic, Sanskrit, and concrete are actually all the same word. So by 500 BCE, Panini had reduced the chaos of the early Vedic language to this perfected language, to Sanskrit. Not long after, perhaps soldiers sitting around a fire after a battle started telling stories of great heroes they had known. Nobody knows. The Mahabharata itself says there is something mysterious about beginnings. Nobody knows how the story of Mahabharata began. Soldiers sitting around a campfire, somebody taking some notes, somebody writing something down. By about 350 before the current era, writing had appeared in India. So from that time on, writing is always a possibility. All we know for sure about the date of the great epic is that in three, uh, 534 of the current era, somebody made a donation of something to somebody else, and that donation is recorded on a copper plate. And the copper plate says, donation is a very good thing, and I can prove this because it says so in the 100,000 verse edition of the Mahabharata. So this is the first written evidence that the Mahabharata existed in roughly the same size as it, as it is today, round about 500 of the current era. The current version of Mahabharata is actually 86,600 verses long, 86,000 verses. So in the year 500, when they said, oh, it's the 100,000 verse version, we can be pretty sure it's the same version or similar to what we have today. So there is a take home fact, Mahabharata, let's call it 100,000 verses long, uh, existed in this form at least 1,500 years ago. It's 1.8 million words long. How long are the seven volumes of Harry Potter? 1 million and 84,170 words. So considerably longer than all seven verses of Harry Potter. My friend Kaylee Smith recently ran the whole of Mahabharata together in a single PDF, and it came to 3,950 pages. This is a very substantial piece of work. Now, there's a, a scholar I, who I love dearly, Wendy Doniger. She's very controversial. She often says things she's, she shouldn't, but she's a great scholar. She says, Mahabharata is 10 times longer than the Iliad plus the Odyssey 
but it's a hundred times more interesting. Now, she really shouldn't have said that. That is very rude, and she shouldn't have said that. I'm sure it's not correct, but uh, I'm talking about the links primarily. There are hundreds of manuscripts of Mahabharata all over India in different scripts on different materials. Now, uh, I'm going to come to, the st to what's in the story shortly, so just bear with me a little bit here. The critical edition, now what is a critical edition? A critical edition is an attempt by scholars to find the original text. Now, this actually came out of 19th century biblical scholarship. When German scholars placed every version of the gospel according to St. Mark out on a table, and they compared them all, and they tried to work out by comparing all of these manuscripts, what was the true word of God? This is what they're really looking for. And they applied this same technique, this textual criticism, when, when they discovered Sanskrit, they applied the same technique to Sanskrit, thinking that by doing that, they might discover the original Mahabharatam. Now, of course, it may never have existed. Just say we're sitting around a campfire, me and Matt, we're sitting around a campfire, we're telling stories. He went home and wrote his version, I went home and wrote my version. There is no original version of those two. So I'm a bit inclined to think this whole search for the Ur text is a, is a little bit of a red herring. It's not something I particularly buy into. Now, uh, there was a huge project in India that ran from 1919 till 1966, that's 47 years. They, they put every manuscript of the Mahabharatam out on a great big table and they tried to determine what version, from which version must all of these have derived. And they published their results in 19 volumes over those 47 years. Uh, now, I brought volume two. You can imagine that the 19 volumes, it's about this long. Uh, Chris said, why didn't you bring volume one? And I didn't bring volume one because volume one is three times as thick of, as that and wouldn't fit in my backpack this afternoon. So I brought volume two. I think every good talk should have some show and tell. So I'm gonna leave this show and tell up the front there. So please do have a look at the critical edition. Now, the funny thing about the critical edition is that it's now become the standard and it's the one that's been digitised, and it's the one that everyone refers to. And so what that has effectively done is marginalised every other version of the text. And you would be considered very, very eccentric if you were quoting from a version of the Mahabharatam that wasn't the critical edition. It's very, very few scholars would do that. So the critical edition, of course, it's an enormous contribution to scholarship. We, we can all access at least this version of the text, but it has reduced the complexity and the variety of uh, the texts that people refer to. It's so easy to go online. You could go to India and chase manuscripts, or you could go online. I can, on my phone, I can dial up the entire Sanskrit text of Mahabharatam. And it's so easy that I'm sorry to say that's what just about everybody is going to do. Uh, I'm going to move forward a little bit. So I, I'm going to start telling you very briefly the, the basic plot of Mahabharatam in a minute. But I just want to remark on the fact that unlike the Ramayanam, which is loved, Ramayanam is the other great Sanskrit epic, the story of Rama and his, his wife Sita. The, the Ramayanam is deeply loved. The Mahabharata is respected and revered, but it's not loved because it's the story of the division and destruction of a family. And my lovely students, uh, very kindly, I was missing one volume of the Sanskrit text at home and my lovely students actually provided the missing text. And it is said that you shouldn't keep all volumes of the Mahabharata together in your home because it is inauspicious. So I just keep it a little way, not that I'm, not that I'm uh, uh, subject to these fears, of course, but I do tend to keep it a little bit away from the other ones. So it is, it, it, it is an extraordinary text. It is foundational to so much uh, of Indic civilization, Indic society, Indic drama, art, music, but it is not loved. It's respected more than loved. Okay, so I'm now going to talk a little bit about what actually happens. What's this story about? What is it about at the most fund fundamental level? As I said, 
two families of warring cousins, two families of princes fighting for the throne, fighting for control of the kingdom. And these are almost the only two names that you need to know, the Kaurava and the Pandava. Kaurava, can I hear this please? Kaurava and Pandava. That's almost all you need to know at this stage. The Kaurava, uh, and again, I hate to use these words good and bad because there's so much complexity here, but just to keep it simple, the Kaurava are the hundred bad cousins. The oldest of the uh, bad cousins, Duryodhana, he says, is a wonderful speech, he says, I want to be dissatisfied. And sometimes I have to say, I feel like that too. Sometimes I just want to feel dissatisfied. He is born bad. He is born dissatisfied. Uh, and he leads his hundred brothers in that direction. On the other hand, there are, again, I don't like to say good because you, no man is, no bad man is entirely bad. No good man is entirely good. The Pandava are the five good cousins, led by Yudhishthira, who is, the, who is uh, noble, true, uh, reliable, always righteous, and yet at one stage even he tells a lie that changes the whole, the whole direction of the, of the war. Uh, so as uh, they grew up together, they were permanently fighting. As adults, the, the, uh, the crux of the story is a game of dice. Now, gambling is a, it's one of the five kingly art forms. It's one of the things kings do, kings play dice. Uh, the Kaurava challenge the Pandava to a game of dice. Yudhishthira plays. First, he loses his treasures. Then he loses his lands. He loses all his properties. He loses his forests and his fields. He loses first one brother and then another brother and then his two twin brothers. He has nothing left but himself. And when I teach this, the students say, why doesn't he just stop? Why can't he stop? And he cannot stop. He's, bought, he's, he's carried by fate to continue playing. He plays and loses himself. And they become, the Pandava become the slaves, the servants of the Kaurava. But the Kaurava say, but you still have one thing that you haven't played, you have a wife. Draupadi is the, the joint wife of the five Pandavas. And they say, play her. And you can win everything back. Yudhishthira plays Draupadi and loses. And is in what is the most chilling episode of the entire epic, poor Draupadi is dragged from from her chambers by her hair, dressed in a single robe, stained in her own menstrual blood, into the assembly of heroes and is flown on, on the floor and said, you are now their slave. It, it really, it's an absolutely chilling episode that cannot fail to affect anyone very deeply, I think. But, of course, fate intervenes and they say, We'll give you one more throw. One more throw. You can have everything back, or here's the deal. If you win, you can have all of your forests, all of your, your, your herds, your mansions, your brothers, your wife, you can have them all back. Or if you lose, you spend 12 years in exile and a further year incognito. And of course, Yudhishthira loses. He has to lose. Fate is set against him. So. They go off to the forest, they spend, uh, they spend 12 years in the wilderness, traveling, visiting pilgrimage sites, collecting weapons for the forthcoming war because there must be a war. And there's a wonderful episode while they're in the wilderness where uh, they come to an enchanted lake that is the property of a yaksha. What is a yaksha? A yaksha is a semi-divine being. They come to an enchanted lake, and we will come back to this in a minute. So just store that away. After the 12 years in exile and their one year, in, in, uh, one year incognito, they come back to the Kaurava and they want their share of the kingdom. And of course, the Kaurava decline. So they say, just give me, just give us five villages, one village each, 
and of course the Kaurava decline. So there must be a war. Now, there's a long, long build-up to the war. Uh, and again, one of the great cruxes in the Mahabharatam is at the very onset of the war. So over here is the Kaurava army, half of humanity. Over here is the Pandava army, the other half of humanity, lined up, facing one another, looking something like this picture here. Now, Arjuna is one of the five Pandava, one of the good brothers. He is the leader of the army of the Pandavas. His charioteer is Krishna, who appears to be a regular human. He's a friend. He's the, he's the friend of Arjuna. But just at the minute the war is supposed to begin, Arjuna le loses his nerve. This is, this is an incredible moment. How could the greatest warrior who has ever lived at the beginning of this cataclysmic battle suddenly lose his nerve? His, it says, the Sanskrit says, his, uh, my, my bow slips from my hand, my mouth is dry, he says. And Krishna cannot believe this sudden lack of steel, this lack of courage. And Krishna then teaches him a very, very famous text in about 400 verses that has become known as the Bhagavad Gita. So this is probably the best known and most loved of Hindu texts, around about 400 verses. And during this period, Krishna teaches Arjuna that life is an illusion. These soldiers you're looking at, your uncles, your brothers, your grandparents, your grandfathers, your great uncles, they are already dead. All you are is the agent of their death. And he teaches Arjuna that it's much more important to act, but don't think about the fruit of your action. And there's a very important Hindu, te uh, Hindu teaching, and you'll find that, that taxi drivers in India, can, if, when they find out you're interested in Sanskrit, this is one of the verses, of course, that they'll begin to sing for you. So the, the Bhagavad Gita is embedded right in the middle of Mahabharata. Then. Very important, very important text. Now, there is a fabulous slaughter. At the end of the war, almost nobody is left alive. It's a hollow victory. All the Kaurava are dead. The five Pandavas survive. They rule the kingdom, but in a sort of what you would call a rather joyless fashion. There's no joy left. There's no pleasure left. Uh, there are a number of different endings. Oh, well, I should say, before we do that, uh, there is a stage in the war where Bhishma, the old great uncle, who is the source of authority and knowledge and general calm right throughout this, is lying on his deathbed. And Yudhishthira asks him for advice. What, how, how does a king exist? How does a king conduct himself? How should a warrior behave? What are the duties of a Brahmin? And this has expanded and expanded and expanded with successive generations of scholars and authors until it's now 400 chapters long. It's easily the world's longest deathbed scene. And I've been reading this for a lot of years. There's a lot of stuff there. It's expanded. It's basically an encyclopedia of uh, Brahmanical uh, conduct. So, um, so, so that, the, that war section has expanded e enormously over the generations. Now, uh, the story has a number of different endings, depending on where you draw your information from. Uh, in most of the endings, the five brothers are left at the end. Uh, 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 th th they leave their kingdom. They've had it. And this is a very Indian thing to do. They just walk off into oblivion. They're walking uh, through the Himalayas along a, a narrow mountain path. And one by one, they disappear over the edge until only Yudhishthira is left. Yudhishthira then has a vision of hell. And he sees in hell all his brothers. How could that be? How could my brothers, who are such good men, be in hell? And then he sees a vision of heaven and all of his enemies, all of the Kaurava, who have, who have wronged him so grievously, are in heaven. And he, he can't believe that this is, the true, this is true, and indeed it is an illusion to test him. The very last 
end, this is the end I like the best, and of course there are multiple endings, but the ending that I like, like the best, I call this the Australian ending. Yudhishthira is in the Himalayas, and a ladder descends from heaven. And the, a voice from, from heaven says, come up. Now, while they were walking, Yudhishthira has picked up a dog. A dog has followed him for the last little bit of the walk. And he looks up and he looks at the dog and he says, I'm not coming without my dog. <laughs> and as far as I'm concerned, that is the quintessential Australian ending, the one that I like the best. Of course, there are many others, but I'm going to leave that there. So, you nice people, there's uh, what I want to do now, <clears throat> very briefly, how are we doing for time, Matt? Uh, Another Ah, that's good. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm going to uh, move forward. Do you remember I left, I left myself on that back step, didn't I? I left myself on the back step under the full moon taking a vow to study Sanskrit for 10 years and I bought Teach Yourself Sanskrit, which I said was a terrible, terrible mistake. It's a dreadful book. Nobody ever got past chapter five. It's based on a fallacy. You cannot teach yourself Sanskrit. You need somebody to teach you. I came back to the ANU and I found lovely tutors and mentors. At that stage, so this is, this is mid-90s, ANU wasn't really teaching Sanskrit in any meaningful way. I found lovely mentors uh, in the persons of Richard Stanley, Royce Wiles, Primoz Pachenko, uh, Sedan and Dadas, both here and in Germany. And I started teaching Sanskrit in the community in around about 2000, uh, let's say around about the year 2000, and then in around about the year 2005. I joined the faculty here, here at the ANU and began teaching here. And I have learnt so much from my mentors, my students particularly. Every class we have, Alex, I'm always learning something, aren't I? There's always something. Haven't, and I've, haven't we learnt so much studying together? We've learnt so much. Now, didn't I say I was going to start reading Sanskrit after 10 years? I actually was running a bit late. I didn't start reading, sorry, I didn't start reading Mahabharatam until the 15th of November 2010. Now, it should have been 2005, but I didn't start till 2010, a little bit later than I hoped. I try to read a page a day but I don't always make it. And it is very, very long. So as of this morning, the 20th of March, 2024, I started 4,874 days ago. I'm 75% of the way through. According to my calculation, I'm due to finish on Wednesday, the 30th of August, 2028, but I'm not holding my breath. Now, interestingly, I put this same information into chat GPT and it said, you'll finish on the 12th of August. So it's got me finishing about 18 days earlier, but you never know with ChatGPT. So that's where we are. Now, I've described to you how, I've described to you how the Mahabharata derailed my life. What I haven't described to you is why it derailed my life. And what I propose is a little dramatization. There, there, must, there must be a thousand episodes in Mahabharatam where you see the depth and the humanity. Uh, you can make this real connection with, with the humanity of the authors. And I've chosen this one little, one little episode that I would like to share with you. You remember I said when the Pandava were in the wilderness, they found an enchanted lake. They had been forbidden to drink from that lake, but the four brothers drank from the lake and fell down dead. Only one brother is still alive, that's Yudhishthira. Now this lake is owned by a yaksha. What is a yaksha? A yaksha is a semi-divine being. It's like a sort of an ethereal spirit. You can't really trust them. Uh, they, they are, are shapeshifters, they can fly, uh, they can spread disease if they want to. The yakshas are not entirely trustworthy. Now this lake is the property of this yaksha. The four brothers are dead on the ground. The one brother is alive. Now I need a volunteer to help me 
with this little bit of dramatization, the duties are not onerous. Oh, there's a hand up. How nice. Uh, madam, thank you. And your name? Gabby. Gabby. Do I detect a little bit of an accent there, Gabby? American. You're American. Nice. Gabby from America, please. Round of applause. <laughs> now, now, Gabby, you are Yudhishthira. Your, your brothers are dead. The Yaksha is asking Yudhishthira a string of riddles. If you can answer these riddles correctly, you will save your brother's lives and you will save your own life. Are you up for it? Can you do it? Yes. Okay, all right. I am a Yaksha. I am a disembodied voice coming down from heaven and Yudhishthira is here on the side of the lake with her brothers. And suddenly I say, what doesn't close its eyes when asleep? The fish. What does not stir when born? An egg. What has no heart? A stone. What grows while running? A river grows while running. What is faster than the wind? Thoughts are faster than the wind. What is more numerous than men? Worries are more numerous than men. What is the best of the falling? Rain is the best of the falling. What is the best of the lying? Seed is the best of the lying. What is the best of the standing? Cows are the best of the standing. What is the best of the speaking? A son is the best of the speaking. What is the friend of a traveler? A caravan. What is the friend at home? The spouse. What is the friend of the sick? The physician. What is the friend of the moribund? Charity is the friend of the moribund. What travels alone? The sun. What once born is born again? The moon. What friend is made by fate? The spouse. What is the support of life? Rain is the support of life. What is the greatest of riches? Ability. Or do you think otherwise, Yaksha? You have answered my questions. Now, drink and fetch your brothers. So thank you very much, Yudhishthira. You did a good job. <laughs> that was really nice. So why have I done this nice, why have Gabby and I done this? It was Gabby, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, it was Gabby, Gabby and I did this nice little performance. Why did we do this? These riddles, like a thousand other episodes from the Mahabharatam, have entertained and delighted audiences for over 2,000 years. It seems to me that they speak directly to us across cultures, across continents and across millennia and somehow, somehow highlight our shared humanity. I love this feeling of connection with the authors, with the creators of the Mahabharatam. In reading, enjoying and sharing these texts, in the words of Wendy Doniger, we can gain a fuller sense of what it means to be human. By exploring ancient texts like this, we have a fuller sense of what it means to be human. And this is why I think the Mahabharatam derailed my life. I love this sense of connection with these, with these times gone by. I've got two, two made up yaksha riddles, two I made up myself. What is the greatest of possessions? Learning is the greatest of possessions. What is the greatest of boons? The privilege of sharing what little one has learnt with friends. So thank you very much, you dear people. I'm really, it's very nice to be here.